All right, tonight we are going to read through chapter 13 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. This will not be just a straight reading because the purpose of this is to improve your English vocabulary and to uh, understand or practice phrases that could be useful to you. So we will be stopping and talking about interesting words and interesting phrases, maybe looking at some pictures or sometimes looking up some definitions because sometimes the, the language in here is very complicated and even I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so uh, if you're watching this live with me, then um, please, if you have any questions, if, if, if I'm reading past something and you have a question about a word or a phrase, uh, just make a question in the remarks and, or in the, in the chat. And if I see it, I will be happy to go back and, and, and reread something for you. So uh, now in, in chapter 12, Davy decided to leave London and go find his aunt. He was very miserable in London. So he, he decided it would be better to find his aunt. And his aunt uh, isn't, doesn't really like him. But it's like his only hope is, is this aunt who he's kind of afraid of. He never met her. She was, she was present on the night that he was born. And she was very angry that he wasn't a girl. And she left. And she never talked to him or his mother again. So, uh, but Davy's so miserable in London, he decides his only hope is to run away and hope that his aunt will take care of him. So he just was uh, running away from, from his home in London and some boy stole all of his clothes and all of his money. So now he has nowhere to go. He can't go back to his home in London. And uh, he was going to take a carriage like a bus to Plymouth, where his aunt, not Plymouth, Dover, where his aunt lives. But now he has to walk with no money, no food, and no clothes. And so the title of chapter 13 is the, se the sequel of my resolution. <clears throat> resolution is another word for decision. And sequel means part two. So this is part two of my decision. So he's in London, no food, no money, no clothes. For anything I know, I may have had some wild idea of running all the way to Dover when I gave up pursuing the pursuit of the young man with the donkey cart. So the young man with the donkey cart stole his money and stole his clothes and Davy was pursuing him. He was running after him and he was saying, I, I, maybe I almost thought about running all the way to Dover. <laughs> My scattered senses were soon collected as to that point. If I had, for I came to a stop in the Kent Road at a terrace with a piece of water before it. And a great foolish image in the middle blowing a dry shell. Here I sat down on a doorstep, quite spent and exhausted with the efforts I had already made, and with hardly a breath enough to cry for the loss of my box and half guinea. So he was running after that boy who stole his clothes and his money, and at some point he stopped and he was very tired and he sat down and started crying because now he has no money, he has no clothes, he has nothing. By this time it was dark. I heard the clocks strike ten as I sat resting, but it was a summer night, fortunately, and fine weather. But I, when I had recovered my breath and had got rid of the stifling sensation in my throat, I rose up and went on. So it's ten o'clock at night, and he decides to start walking towards Dover. In the midst of my distress, I had no notion of going back. I doubt if I should have had any, though there had been a Swiss snowdrift in the Kent Road. 
A Swiss snowdrift. He just said it was summer. Well, let me see what that is. Oh, wait. I had no intention of going back. I doubt if I should have had any. Though, the, oh, I think he's saying even, even if the road was blocked with a lot of snow, I still would continue. I think that's what he's saying. Okay. But my standing, possessed of only three halfpence in the world, and I'm sure I wonder how they came to be left in my pocket on a Saturday night, troubled me nonetheless because I went on. I began to picture myself as a scrap of newspaper intelligence, my being found dead in a day or two under some hedge, and I trudged on miserably, though as fast as I could, until I happened to pass a little shop where it was written up that ladies' and gentlemen's wardrobes were bought, and that the best price was given for rags, bones, and kitchen stuff. Davy's walking down this road, and he's, he's imagining in his head like a newspaper article about the boy who was found dead. <laughs> He, that's him, of course. He's imagining he's going to die on this road, trying to find his aunt. And he finds a shop with a sign that says that they buy used things. They buy clothes. They buy different articles that you have, your possessions. The master of this shop was sitting at the door in his shirt sleeves, smoking, and as there were a great many coats and pairs of trousers dangling from the low ceiling, the only two feeble candles burning inside to show what they were, I fancied that he looked like a man of a revengeful disposition, who had hung all of his enemies and was enjoying himself. This man looks very scary to Davy. My late experiences with Mr. and Mrs. Micawber suggested to me that here might be a means of keeping off the wolf for a little while. I went up to the next by street, took off my waistcoat, rolled it neatly under my arm, and came back to the shop door. When Davy was in the company of the Micawbers, they taught him how to pawn things. You know, pawning is when you go to a store and you say, here is my valuable possession, give me money for it. And they usually don't give you very much, but the Micawbers were always doing that. And, and Davy helped them do that. So he knew what that shop was. He walked past it and then took off his waistcoat, which means vest, and rolled it up, put it under his arm and walked back to the store. If you please, sir, I said, I'm to sell this for a fair price. Mr. Dollaby. Dollaby was the name over the shop door, at least. Took the waistcoat, stood his pipe on its head against the doorpost, went into the shop, followed by me, snuffed two candles with the, snuffed the two candles with his fingers. That means he extinguished the, the flame spread the waistcoat on the counter and looked at it there, held it up against the light and looked at it there and ultimately said, what do you call a price now for this here little west kit waistcoat? Oh, you know, the, you know best, sir, I returned modestly. I can't be buyer and seller too, said Mr. Dollaby. Put a price on this here little waistcoat. <laughs> Would eight pence be, I hinted after some hesitation. Mr. Dollaby rolled it up again and gave it back to me. I should rob my family, he said, if I was to offer nine pence for it. The shop owner is saying, how much do you want for it? And Davy said 18 pence. And uh, Mr. Dollaby said, I couldn't even give you nine. I can't even give you nine pence for that. This was a disagreeable way of putting the business because it imposed upon me, a perfect stranger, the unpleasantness of asking Mr. Dollaby to rob his family on my account. 
My circumstances being so very pressing, however, I said I would take ninepence for it if he pleased. Mr. Dollaby, not without some grumbling, grumbling is brrr, gave ninepence. I wished him good night and walked out of the shop. The richer by that sum, than the poor, uh, and the poorer by a waistcoat. But when I buttoned my jacket, that was not much. Indeed, for I foresaw pretty clearly that my jacket would go next, and that I should have to make the best of my way to Dover in a shirt and a pair of trousers, and might deem myself lucky if I got there in that trim. Davy understands at some point he's going to also have to sell his, his jacket so he sold his best. That wasn't really a big deal. But he knows that he's going to also have to sell his jacket eventually. And then he'll be uh, practically naked. Beyond a, generable, uh, beyond, beyond a general impression of the distance before me and of the young man with the donkey cart having used me cruelly, I think I had no very urgent sense of my difficulties when I once again set off with my nine pence in my pocket. Davy's thinking, he doesn't realize what kind of danger he's in on this little, <laughs> this little tour he's taking. But it's actually a very serious situation. He's not feeling that yet. <clears throat> a plan had occurred to me for passing the night which I was going to carry into execution. This was to lie behind the wall at the back of my old school in a corner where there used to be a haystack. It seems that Davy is going to pass his old school and he knows that there's a place where he can hide and spend the night. So that's where he's planning. He's planning on walking to his old school and hide there for the night. I imagined it would be a kind of company to have the boys and the bedroom where I used to tell the stories so near me. Although the boys would know nothing of my being there and the bedroom would yield me no shelter. It might even feel nice for him to spend the night near the school just so he can think of his old friends, even though he won't see them or talk to them. I had a hard day's work and was pretty well jaded when I came climbing out at last upon the level of Blackheath. Of Blackheath. It cost me some trouble to find out Salem House, but I found it, and I found a haystack in the corner, and I lay down by it. Well, just in case you don't know what a haystack is, I think we should probably show this. Let's just find a picture of a haystack. So he, he's planning on sleeping in a haystack, which I guess could be a little bit comfortable. No, I think probably it wouldn't be comfortable. It would probably hurt. <laughs> Very pointy. I found a haystack in the corner, and I lay down by it, having first walked round the wall, and looking up at the windows, and seen that all was dark and silent within. Never shall I forget the lonely sensation of first lying down without a roof above my head. That was the first time that he slept outside without a roof over his head, and he's saying I will never forget that. Sleep came upon me as it came upon many other outcasts against whom house doors were locked and house dogs barked at that night, and I dreamed of lying on my old school bed talking to the boys in my room and found myself sitting upright with Steerforth's name upon my lips. Steerforth was his best friend and hero at school. Looking wildly at the stars that were glistening and glimmering above me, so the stars that were shining above him. When I remembered where I was at that untimely hour, 
A feeling stole upon me that made me get up, afraid of I don't know what, and walk about. But the fainter glimmering of the stars and the pale light in the sky, where the day was coming, reassured me, and my eyes, being very heavy, I lay down again and slept. Though with a knowledge in my sleep that it was cold until the warm beams of the sun and the ringing of the getting up bell at Salem House awoke me. If I could have hoped that Steerforth was there, I would have lurked about until he came out alone. If Davy had known that his, his friend and hero Steerforth would appear, would come out and, and be alone, maybe Davy would have waited for him. But I knew he must have left long since. But he didn't think that uh, Steerforth was even at the school. Traddles still remained, perhaps, but it was very doubtful, and I had not sufficient confidence in his discretion or good luck. However, however strong my reliance was on his good nature to wish to trust him with my situation, so I crept away from the wall as Mr. Creakle's boys were getting up and struck into the long, dusty track, which I had first known to be the Dover Road, when I was one of them, and when I little expected that any eyes would see me, the wayfarer, I was now upon it. What a different Sunday morning from the old Sunday morning in Yarmouth. In due time, I heard the church bells ringing, and I plodded along. Plodding is like this. I plodded along. <laughs> so that's how he's walking. And I met people who were going to church, and I passed a church or two where the congregation were inside, and the sound of singing came out into the sunshine, while the beetle sat and cooled himself in the shade of the porch, or stood beneath the yew tree with his hand to his forehead, glowering at me, going by. What is glowering? Let's see, glowering. It's not an important word. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Glowering. Let's see. Having an angry or sullen look. So the beetle, which is some kind of uh, official at the church, Davy was walking by and he was looking at him with a very, a very unpleasant face, a very unfriendly face, glowering at him. <clears throat> I wouldn't recommend using that word. But the peace and rest of the old Sunday morning were on everything except me, and that was the difference. I felt quite wicked in my dirt and dust with my tangled hair. But for the quiet picture I had conjectured up of my mother in her youth and beauty, weeping by the fire, crying by the fire, and my aunt relenting to her, I hardly think I should have had the courage to go on until the next day. But it always went before me, and I followed. So Davy is thinking, if he... They, uh, they used to, when he was younger, when he was with his mother and Peggotty, the maid, they used to sit in the parlor, the, like the living room, the front room of the house. And they, they used to, the mother used to tell the story of how the aunt came that night when Davy was born and how horrible she was. And Davy is saying, if I thought about that now... I might have actually turned around and started walking back to London, but the road just kept going in front of me, and I just kept following it. So he, he wasn't thinking about uh, how horrible she might be to him when they meet again. I got that Sunday through three and twenty miles on the straight road. So he walked twenty miles, twenty-three miles. How many... Kilometers is that? Let's see. Miles to <laughs> kilometers. Let's see. 23 miles is. Oh, so that's 37 kilometers he walked that day. So I got that Sunday through 3 and 20 miles, or how much was that? That was 37 kilometers.
on the straight road through not very easily, though not very easily, for I was new to this kind of toil. Toil means like difficult work or hard work. And Davy's saying it was difficult to walk for that long because I wasn't used to it. I've never done that before. It was very difficult and hard. Toil. Hard work. I see myself, as evening closes in, coming over the bridge at Rochester, foot sore and tired, and eating bread that I had bought for supper. One or two little houses with the notice, lodgings for travelers, hanging out, had tempted me, but I was afraid of spending a few pence I had, and was even more afraid of the vicious looks of the trampers I had met or overtaken. So Davy is walking down this road, and sometimes there are other people, kind of like him, I guess, walking in the other direction, and they give him mean, ugly looks. And he was afraid to go into any kind of business or have any interactions with people because he looked very dirty, and they would give him these ugly looks and make him feel very unwanted and sad. I sought no shelter, therefore, but the sky, and toiling into Chatham. There's that word toil again, which means hard work. Which, which in that night's aspect is a mere dream of chalk and drawbridges and mastless ships in a muddy river, roofed like Noah's arks, crept at least upon a sort of grass-grown battery overhanging a lane, where a sentry was walking to and fro. A sentry is like a guard, so maybe like the police, sort of. Here I lay down near a cannon, and happy in the society of the sentry's footsteps, though he knew no more of my being above him than uh, that of the boys at Salem House had known of my lying by the wall, slept soundly in the morning. Da because there was this sentry, like a guard, like a police officer, you know, standing around watching, uh, guarding something, Davy decided to go sleep around where he was. And th the sentry didn't know he was there, but Davy felt safer knowing that the sentry was there. Very stiff and sore of foot, I was in the morning and quite dazed by the beating of drums and the marching of troops. So this is like maybe a military camp. He's, he's near a, a military camp, which is why there is a sentry or a guard there which seemed to hem me in on every side. I went towards the long, narrow street, feeling that I could go but a very little way that day. If I were to reserve any strength for getting to my journey's end, I resolved to make the sale of my jacket its principal business. A court, oh, that's kind of a complicated sentence, wait. If I were to reserve any strength for getting to my journey's end, what he's saying is he needed money for food, so he had to sell his coat so that he could make more money and, and get, get some food. Accordingly, I took the jacket off that I might learn to do without it, and carrying it under my arm, began, to, began a tour of inspection of the various slop shops. <laughs> Uh, so Davy decides to not wear his jacket anymore because he wants to get used to not having it because he knows that he has to sell it. So he takes off the jacket and starts walking around. Now it's funny, this term slop shop. I wonder if that has a special meaning. I mean, I know what slop is in my mind, but I wonder if it means something else, perhaps in the UK. What is a slop shop? Cheap ready-made clothing may be purchased. Okay, so it's a place where they sell cheap clothes. When I think of slop, I think of disgusting food. So let's see if we have slop. Okay, here's some pictures. Yeah, when I if I just Google slop and we look at the pictures, it just looks like uh, ugly, disgusting food. But a slop shop, I guess, is a place where they sell cheap clothes. 
Okay. It was a likely place to sell a jacket in, for the dealers in second-hand clothes were numerous and were generally speaking on the lookout for customers at their shop doors. To be on the lookout, that means they're, they're really actively looking for something. So the, the dealers, the sellers, were always looking for more clothes. But as most of them had hanging up among their stock, an officer's coat or two, epaulets and all, I was rendered timid by the costly nature of their dealings and walked about for a long time without offering my merchandise to anyone. Davy saw some of these slop shops, but he felt intimidated or embarrassed because it looked like they had pretty expensive clothes and he thought they wouldn't want his dirty old jacket. So he was very shy about going to any of these stores and just kept walking around. This modesty of mine directed my attention to the marine store shops and such shops as Mr. Dollaby's in preference to the regular dealers. At the corner of a dirty lane, ending in an enclosure full of stinging nettles against the palings of which some second-hand sailor's clothes that seemed to have overflowed the shop were fluttering, this is fluttering, among some cots and rusty guns and oilskin hats and certain trays full of so many old rusty keys of so many sizes that they seemed very in, various enough to open all the doors in the world. It's a junk shop. <laughs> he found a junk shop with clothes, a lot of clothes. In this shop, which was low and small, and which was darkened rather than lighted by a little window, overcome with clothes and was descended into by some steps, I went with a palpitating heart. So his heart was going boom, 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 boom. He was very scared. Which was not relieved when an ugly old man, with the lower part of his face all covered with stubby gray beard, stubbly gray beard. Let's see. Let's look at a picture of stubble so you can see what stubble is. Stubble is when you need to shave. So, I mean, in these pictures, it looks good, <laughs> but. This is an ugly old man with stubble, so it looks like he needs to take a shower and shave, and uh, they don't have any ugly stubble. I wonder why. You only see nice stubble. Now let's read that again. So there was an ugly old man with the lower part of his face all covered with a stubbly gray beard rushed out of a dirty den behind it and seized me, oh, by the hair of my head. He was a dreadful old man to look at in a filthy flannel waistcoat and, sm and smelling terribly of rum, his bedstead covered with tumbled and ragged pieces of patchwork was in the den and he had come fr that he had come from where another little window showed a prospect of more stinging nettles and a lame donkey. So this man lives in a very dirty little room. A den is like a a place where you live. It's like a living room or something like that. A, uh, you use that in modern English to talk about uh, like a family room, a less formal room, a, a place, a room to, to relax. But here I think it means the place where he sleeps. Because then Davy's describing a bed, a dirty, ugly old bed. <laughs> oh, what do you want? Grinned this old man in a fierce, monotonous whine. Whining is like, oh, whining, it's whining. It's like, oh, what do you want? Like that. Oh, my eyes and limbs, what do you want? Oh, my lungs and liver, what do you want? Oh, guru, guru. 
I was so much dismayed by these words, and particularly by the repetition of the last unknown one, which was a kind of rattle in his throat. Rattling is like ch -ch 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 -ch, so that that guru guru came from his throat, and it was like a disgusting sound. And Davy was so surprised by it that he didn't know what to say. He was he was shocked. Hereupon, the old man, still holding me by the hair, repeated, Oh, what do you want? Oh, my eyes and limbs, what do you want? Oh, my lungs and liver, what do you want? Oh, guru! Which he screwed out of himself with an energy that made his eyes start in his head. We've already seen that word start several times. It doesn't mean begin here. It means surprise. So when... When Davy says his eyes started out of his head, that probably, let's see, let's look at a picture. <laughs> okay, well, this is, this is kind of extreme. I'm sure he doesn't mean this, but, you know, something a little bit less extreme. <laughs> so these are like the eyes starting out of his head, something like this. It's gross. So he's saying these words with such energy that his eyes are starting out of his head or popping out of his head. I wanted to know, I said, trembling. Davy is really scared. If you would buy a jacket. Oh, let's see the jacket, cried the old man. Oh, my heart on fire, show the jacket to us. Oh, my eyes and limbs, bring the jacket out. With that, he took his trembling hands, which were like claws of a great bird, out of my hair and put on a pair of spectacles. Those are glasses. Not at all ornamental to his inflamed eyes. Oh, how much for the jacket, cried the old man after examining it. Oh, guru, how much for the jacket? Half a crown, I answered, recovering myself. Oh, my lungs and liver, cried the old man. No, oh, my eyes, no, oh, my limbs, no. Eighteen pence, guru. Every time he uttered this ejaculation, that's the uh, guru, his eyes seemed to be in danger of starting out. So every time you say guru, his eyes popped out. And every sentence he spoke, he delivered in a sort of tune, always exactly the same, and more like a gust of wind. A gust of wind would be like, which begins low and mounts up high and falls again. Than any other comparison I can find for it. Well, said I, glad to have closed the bargain, I'll take eighteen pence. Oh, my liver, cried the old man, throwing the jacket on the shelf. Get out of the shop. Oh, my lungs, get out of the shop. Oh, my eyes and limbs, guru, don't ask for money. <laughs> Make it an exchange. So the, the, the old man offered eighteen pence, and Davy said, okay. And now the old man is saying, no, 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 don't take money. Pick an item. Pick something from the store to take. I was so frightened in my life before or since. I've never was so frightened in my life before or since. But I told him humbly that I wanted money and that nothing else was of any use to me. But I would wait for it as he desired outside and had no wish to hurry him. So I went outside and sat down in the shade in a corner. And I sat there so many hours that the shade became sunlight and the sunlight became shade again. And still I sat there waiting for the money. Davy said, okay, uh, I'll wait. You told me to wait outside. I'll wait outside, but you have to give me money. I need money. I don't need any of your junk any of your slop. So Davy sat outside, but the man never came out to give him the money. 
There was never such another drunken madman in that line of business, I hope. That he was so well known in the neighborhood and enjoyed the reputation of having sold himself to the devil. I soon understood from the visit he received from the boys, who continually came skirmishing about the shop, shouting that legend, and calling him to bring out his gold. <laughs> you ain't poor, you know, Charlie, as you pretend. Bring out your gold. Bring out some of the gold you sold yourself to the devil for. Come. It's in the lining of the mattress, Charlie. Rip it open. Let's have some. <laughs> so the boys of the neighborhood, uh, because he's such a weird man, they were convinced that he sold his soul to the devil for gold. And they're saying, we know you have the gold in there. Give us your gold. So the boys of the neighborhood would go there and and uh, torture him <laughs> with this story that they made up. Rip it open. Let's have some. They're saying, we know where you're hiding the gold. Let me just show you a mattress. In case you're not sure what that is. So they're saying, we know that you have your gold and it's in your mattress. So rip open the mattress and take out the gold and give us some. Charlie, rip it open. Let's have some. This and many offers to lend him a knife. And the boys would say, here, I'll even give you a knife. Rip open the mattress. Give us your gold for the purpose, exacerbated him, exacer exasperated him to such a degree that the whole day was a succession of rushes on his part and flights on the, on the part of the boys. The boys would come and say, give us your gold. We know you have your gold that you sold your soul to the devil. Give us your gold. And the old man would come running and chase after them and they would run away. And then Several minutes later, they would come back, and they repeated that all day long. <laughs> Sometimes, in his rage and his anger, he would take me for he would he would take me for one of them, and come at me. So sometimes he was so angry, he would think Davy was one of the boys, and so he would run at him and try to attack Davy. mouthing as if he were going to tear me to pieces and then remembering me just in time would dive into the shop and lie upon his bed as i thought from the sound of his voice yelling in a frantic way to his own windy tune the death of nelson with an o oh before every line and innumerable <laughs> gurus interspersed as if this were not bad enough for me the boys connecting me with the establishment on account of the patience and perseverance with which I sat outside half dressed, pelted me and used me very ill all day. Now, these same boys who were uh, making jokes about the old man, give us your gold. They, they noticed Davy sitting there and they understood that he was um, waiting for money from this man. So he was poor and he went in there to sell something and he was uh, waiting for money. And it says the boys pelted him, which means they were throwing rocks at him. So when, when they noticed Davy, they started uh, teasing him and throwing rocks at him or throwing things at him. He made many, many attempts to induce me to consent to an exchange. At one time coming out with a fishing rod so the, the old man doesn't want to give Davy the money. He doesn't want to give him cash. So he's coming out and offering him things instead of money. So he offers a fishing rod. Let me show you a picture of a fishing rod in case you don't know. This is a fishing rod. So instead of money, the, the old man wanted to give him a fishing rod. At another, with a fiddle, a fiddle is another word for a violin. So he came out with a violin and said, here, take the violin. I don't want to give you money. Another with a cocked hat, a hat, you know, but a cocked hat means uh, 
maybe it's off to the side like this, and another with a with a flute. But I resisted all of these overtures and sat there in desperation, each time asking him with tears in my eyes for my money or my jacket. At last he began to pay me in half pence at a time and was a full two hours getting by easy stages to a shilling. Oh, my eyes and limbs, he then cried, peeping hideously out of the shop after a long pause. Will you go for two pence more? I can't, I said. I shall be starved. Oh, my lungs and liver. Will you go for three pence? So he's trying to bargain Davy down to, to less money. I would go for nothing if I could, I said, but I want the money badly. Oh, Guru, it is really impossible to express how he twisted this ejaculation out of himself as he peeped round the doorpost at me, showing nothing but his crafty old head. Will you go for four pence? I was so faint and weary that I closed with this offer, and taking the money out of his claw, not without trembling, trembling, went away more hungry and thirsty than I had ever been a little before sunset. But at an expense of three pence, I soon refreshed myself completely, and being in better spirits, then limped seven miles upon my road. My bed at night was under a haystack, where I rested comfortably after having washed my blistered feet. Let me show you what blistered feet is. This probably will be disgusting, but you might as well know what blisters are. Uh, blisters are these. So if you walk too much or your shoes are bad, you will get blisters on your feet. These are blisters. So Davy's got blistered feet from all of his walking. I'm just going to take a, a one minute break and I will be back in just a second. Okay, we are back. I got to put my mood music back on. Okay. After having washed my blistered feet in a stream <clears throat> and dressed them as well as I was able with some cool leaves, uh, dressing a wound means putting like a bandage around them. So when he says he dressed his blisters, that means he took some leaves and he put them around his feet, maybe to protect them or make them feel better. When I took the road again next morning, 
I found that it lay through a succession of hop grounds and orchards. It was uh, sufficiently late in the year for the orchards to be ruddy with ripe apples. So an apple orchard, that's like an apple farm. And in a few places, the hop pickers were already at work. Hop, if, if it's what I think it is, is an ingredient for beer and maybe other kinds of alcohol. I thought it extremely beautiful and made up my mind to sleep among the hops that night, imagining some cheerful companionship and the long perspectives of poles with the graceful leaves twining around them. The trampers were worse than ever that day and inspired me with a dread that is yet quite fresh in my mind. Uh, tramp. You know, tramping would be like walking in a kind of uneven way. And there's a word tramp, which means like, uh, hope. well, here, wait, let me show you a picture of a tramp. There's another word, hobo, but you probably don't know that word either. But, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a traveling homeless person. Uh, so I think that maybe that word tramp comes from this word trampers. That's what I'm guessing anyway. Because he keeps referring to these trampers and they sound scary and bad. And I think it must be these people. Th these tramps. The trampers were worse than ever that day and inspired me with such dread so he was so scared of these people. Some of them were the most ferocious looking ruffians. So ferocious, that's like a, an animal ready to attack. And ruffians, that's a like a, a dirty, violent person who stared at me as I went by and stopped, perhaps, and called after me to come back to speak to them. So sometimes they would walk by and they'd look at them and then they'd stop and say, you, come over here. Uh, let's see. And when I took to my heels, stoned me. So when they did that, when they said, you, get over here, Davy would start running. He took to his heels. That means he started running. And so they would, they would throw things at him. They would throw stones at him when he ran away. I recollect, I remember, I recollect one young fellow, a tinker. A tinker is a, a person who travels from village to village fixing things. So that's kind of a tramp. They have a bad reputation, I think. Uh, I suppose from his wallet and, and brassiere, who had a woman with him who faced about and stared at me thus, and then roared to me in such a tremendous voice to come back, that I halted, I stopped, and looked round. Come here when you're called, said the tinker, or I'll rip your young body open. I thought it best to go back. As I drew nearer to him, as I came closer, trying to propitiate the tinker by my looks, I observed that, that the woman had a black eye. Where are you going? said the tinker, gripping the bosom of my shirt with his blackened hand. I'm going to Dover, I said. Where do you come from? asked the tinker, giving his hand another turn of my shirt to hold me more securely. I come from London, I said. What lay are you upon? I don't know what that means. What lay are you upon? asked the tinker. Are you a prig? No, I said. Ain't you? By... If you make a brag of your honesty to me. If you make a brag of your honesty to me, said the tinker, I'll knock your brains out. I don't know what he's asking. I don't really understand what he's asking there. With his disengaged hand, that means he let go. With his dis... Oh, no, he's holding with one hand. This is his disengaged hand here. With his disengaged hand, 
he made a menace of striking me. So he pretended he was going to hit me with his free hand, with his disengaged hand, and then looked at me from head to foot. Have you got the price of a pint of beer about you? So he's saying, do you have money for beer? Give me money for beer, said the tinker. If you have, out with it before I take it away. So he says, give me the money for beer or I'll take it from you. I should certainly have produced it. But then I met the woman's look and saw her very slightly shake her head and form no with her lips. So the, the man said, give me the money, give me your money. And the woman with the black eye that was with him went, <laughs> I'm very poor, I said, attempting to smile, and I've got no money. Why, what do you mean, said the tinker, looking so sternly at me. Then I almost feared that he saw the money in my pocket. Sir, I stammered. Stammering is like this. S -s -s Sir. So he's very nervous. What do you mean, said the tinker, by wearing my brother's silk handkerchief? Give it over here. Uh, a handkerchief, remember, we've had that word before, but just in case you don't remember or you're new, <laughs> a handkerchief was a very common thing back then. It still is. Men use it for decoration. Uh, on their with their suits and they call it a pocket square but it was very common to to have a see I wouldn't call this a handkerchief I would just call this a kerchief really they call it a bandana but you could call it's technically a kerchief uh, and sometimes if you wear it around your neck especially back then that's like 170 years ago they would call it a neckerchief so a handkerchief is for your hand and a neckerchief is for your neck and uh, what did the what did the tinker call it here? Let's see. He calls it a handkerchief. So what do you mean, said the tinker, by wearing my brother's silk silk handkerchief? So Davy has a nice expensive handkerchief, and the the tinker is saying, "That's my brother's handkerchief. You stole it. Give it to me." And he had mine off the off my neck in a moment, and tossed it to the woman. The woman burst into a fit of laughter, so the woman started laughing, as if she thought this was a joke, and she tossed it back to me. Nodded once, and slightly as before, and made the word go with her lips, so, so she was, she went. Before I could obey, however, the tinker seized the handkerchief out of my hand with a roughness that threw me away like an old feather and put it loosely around his own neck and turned upon the woman with an oath and knocked her down. So he hit, he hit the woman. I never shall forget seeing her fall backwards on the hard road. I never shall forget seeing her fall backward on the hard road and lie there with her bonnet tumbled off her hair, all whitened in the dust, nor when I looked back from the distance, seeing her sitting on the pathway, which was a bank by the roadside, wiping the blood from her face with the corner of her shawl while he went on ahead. This adventure frightened me so that afterwards, when I saw any of these people coming, I turned back until I could find a hiding place where I remained until they had gone out of sight, which happened so often that I was very seriously delayed. Because of this incident, now every time Davy sees somebody walking towards him on the road, he looks for a hiding place and he, he hides until the person is gone. So now his, his journey is taking much longer because of this. 
But under this difficulty, as under all other difficulties of my journey, I seem to be sustained and led on by my fanciful picture of my mother in, in her youth. Before I came into the world, it always kept me company. It was there among the hops when I lay down to sleep. It was with me on my waking in the morning. It went before me all day. I have associated it ever since with the sunny street of Canterbury, dozing as it were in the hot light and with the sight of its old houses and gateways and the stately gate and the stately gray cathedral with the rooks sailing round the towers. When I came at last upon the bare wide downs near Dover, it relieved the solitary aspect of the scene with hope. And not until I reached that first great aim of my journey and actually set foot in the town itself on the sixth day of my flight, did it desert me. The only thing that kept Davy walking was imagining his mother, who was now dead, but imagining her when she was young and pretty, even before Davy was born. And so he just kept that image in his head and was thinking about her. And he finally made it to Dover, where his, his aunt, his mean, evil aunt lives. So he finally arrived, but after six days, it took him six days of walking every day all day to get there. But then, strange to say, when I stood with my ragged shoes and my dusty, sunburnt, half-clothed figure in the place so long desired, it seemed to vanish like a dream and leave me helpless and dispirited. And now that he's arrived in Dover, that picture that he kept in his head of his mother has disappeared. And suddenly he's looking at himself uh, he's got dirty old clothes uh, and his shoes are falling apart he look, and he's, he's half naked. He's, he... I inquired about my aunt among the boatmen first and received various answers. One said that she lived south of the Foreland Light and had singed her whiskers by doing so. So, um, you know, if you if you picture a witch... It just, I'm sure you probably know what a witch is, but just in case you don't, let's, let's look at a picture. Because the ant has a reputation for being really mean and horrible to everyone. So when they say, oh, do you know my aunt, Miss Betsy Trotwood? <laughs> uh, they're making jokes that she's a witch. And one says that she singed her whiskers on the light. Uh, Whiskers are, does this, does this one have whiskers? That's like a mustache or a beard when you have whiskers. So, so obviously whisk, uh, by saying that she burnt her whiskers, they're implying that she's a witch. Let's see, also, uh, you know, of course, in case you don't know this, uh, witches ride around on their brooms. That will be important in a minute, <laughs> so we don't have to go back and look at this picture again. So here's a witch riding on a broom. Okay. So he's asking about his aunt, and they're making jokes that she's a witch. Another said that she made a fast, uh, she made fast to the great boy outside the harbor and could only be visited at the half tide. A third said that she was locked up in Maidstone Jail for child stealing. That's another thing, I guess, you know, witches have a reputation for stealing children. <laughs> Fourth, that she was seen to mount a broom, that means sit on a broom, in the last high wind and make direct for Calais in France. So <laughs> she took her broom and flew to France. <laughs> The fly drivers, among whom I inquired next, were equally jocose and equally disrespectful. So he, he asked other people, and they also made jokes that she was a witch and, and were joking about him and, and about her and saying bad things about her. And the shopkeepers, not liking my appearance, generally replied without hearing what I had to say, that they had got nothing for me. 
And when Davy went to the shopkeepers, when he went to the stores, they would see how dirty he was and his clothes, and they wouldn't even listen to what he was saying. They would just say, sorry, I don't have anything for you, and close the door. I felt more miserable and destitute than I had done at any period of my running away. My money was all gone. I had nothing left to dispose of. I had nothing left to sell. I was hungry, thirsty, and worn out. Worn out means very tired. And seemed as distant from my end as if I had remained in London. The morning had worn away in these inquiries, so he spent all morning asking people about his aunt, but nobody would tell him where his aunt lived. They would just make jokes about witches. And I was sitting on the step of an empty shop at a street corner near the marketplace, deliberating upon wandering towards those other places which had been mentioned, when a fly driver coming by with his carriage dropped a horse cloth. Something good-natured in the man's face as I handed it to him encouraged me to ask him if, I could, if he could tell me where Miss Trotwood lived, though I had asked the question so often that it almost died upon my lips. So a carriage driver, a man driving a cart with a horse, was driving past Davy and he dropped something by accident and Davy picked it up and he handed it to him. And there was something about the face of the driver that maybe that made Davy think, oh, this is a nice man. This is, maybe I'll ask him where my aunt lives. And uh, so let's see. He says, Trotwood, said he. Let me see. I know the name too. Old lady? Yes, I said, rather. Pretty stiff in the back, he said, making himself upright. So st stiff means doesn't move. So stiff in the back would mean like this, like very serious, very um, straight. And he even did that, very stiff in the back. He even sat up when he did that. Yes, I said, I should think it very likely. Carries a bag, said he. Bag with a good deal of room in it is gruffish and comes down upon you sharp. <laughs> so that's that means uh, she's very, very difficult to deal with. So very difficult to deal with, very, dif very difficult to make friends with, to talk to. My heart sank within me as I acknowledged the undoubted accuracy of this description. So uh, Davy saying, yeah, that's her, that's her. <laughs> Why then, I tell you what, said he, if you go up there pointing with his whip towards the heights and keep right until you come to some houses facing the sea, I think you'll hear of her. My opinion is she won't stand anything. So here's a penny for you. So, so actually the, the driver knows where she lives and he tells him which way to go. But he also warns him saying, She's not going to want to talk to you. And he gives him some money. He gives Davy a penny. I accepted the gift, thankfully, and bought a loaf with it, dispatching this refreshment by the way. I went in the direction my friend had indicated and walked on a good distance without coming to the houses he had mentioned. At length, I saw some before me and approaching them, went into a little shop. It was what we used to call a general shop at home. And inquired if they could have the goodness to tell me where Miss Trotwood lived. I addressed myself to a man behind the counter who was weighing some rice for a young woman. But the latter, taking the inquiry to herself, turned round quickly. Davy walks into a shop near where he sees these houses where maybe his aunt lives. And he asks the shopkeeper, do you know where Miss Betsy Trotwood lives? But he's helping a customer, a young woman who's buying rice. And the young woman turns around and she says, my mistress? She said, what do you want with her boy? So mistress, if you know the word master, mistress is the feminine form of the word master. So that means my boss. This girl works for Miss Trotwood. 
I want, I replied, to speak to her, if you please. To beg of her, you mean, retorted the damsel. Begging means like, please, please give me money. So uh, you know, the girl sees Davy. He's got his dirty, ripped clothes. He's not really wearing a lot of clothes. And his shoes are in bad condition. And he's very dirty. So she thinks that he wants to find Miss Trotwood to ask her for money. He says, I want to talk to her. And she says, no, you mean you want to beg from her. No, I said, indeed. But suddenly remembering that in truth, I came for no other purpose, I held my peace in confusion and felt my face burn. So Davy is thinking, well, actually, I, I kind of do want to beg from her. And he becomes embarrassed. That's why he says his face, his, his face was burning with embarrassment. My aunt's handmaid, as I suppose she was from what she had said, put her rice in a little basket and walked out of the shop, telling me that I could follow her if I wanted to know where Miss Trotwood lived. I needed no second permission, though I was by this time in such a state of consternation and agitation that my legs shook under me. So the, girls, the girl didn't really say, come with me. She said, you know, follow me if you want. I'm going there now. And Davy followed. I followed the young woman, and we soon came to a very neat little cottage with cheerful bow windows. In front of it, a small squared gravel court or garden full of flowers, carefully tended and smelling deliciously. This is Miss Trotwood's, said the young woman. Now you know, and that's all I have to, and that's all I've got to say about it. With which words she hurried into the house as if to shake off the responsibility of my appearance, and left me standing at the garden gate, looking disconsolately over the top towards the parlor window, where a muslin curtain partly undrawn in the middle, a large round green screen or fan fastened to the window sill, a small table, and a great chair suggested to me that my aunt might be at the moment seated in an awful state. So Davy's looking at the house and he can see the parlor window and he sees like a green screen there. And he imagines on the other side of the screen, his aunt is sitting there in an awful state, meaning she's sitting there like this. <laughs> Cause that's the image. He's never met her before. He's only heard horrible stories about her. So he's really afraid of what's going to happen when he finally meets her. My shoes were by this time in a woeful condition. Woe means sad or pathetic. So if something is woeful, that means they're in a very sad state, a very pathetic state. So my shoes were in a very bad condition. The souls had shed themselves. That means the souls had gone away from the shoes bit by bit, and the upper leathers had broken and burst until the very shape and forms of the shoes had departed from them. My hat, which had served me for a nightcap too, was so crushed and bent that no old battered handless saucepan on a dunghill need have been ashamed to vie with it. Uh, that means that uh, it would have looked very nice in a garbage dump. <laughs> it would have been the perfect place for his hat, was in a garbage dump. My shirt and trousers, stained with heat, dew, grass, and the Kentish soil on which I had slept, and torn besides, might have frightened the birds from my aunt's garden. As I stood at the gate, my hair had known no comb or brush since I left London. My face, neck, and hands from unaccustomed exposure to the air and sun, were burnt to a berry brown. He's not used to spending a lot of time outside. So, so walking in the sun these past, this past week has burnt all of his skin, and now his, the, the color of his skin is very brown and red. From head to foot, I was powdered almost as white with chalk, and dust, and, and he was also covered in dust, 
white dust. <laughs> and if I had come out of a lime kiln, as if I had come out of a lime kiln. So uh, that would be, that, let's look at that, lime kiln. That's like where they make pottery or bricks or something. Oh, I guess it's kind of an old thing because I was hoping they would show pictures of somebody covered in dust, but I guess you could imagine. So it's a place where they they burn things to, well, they burn lime, So and lime is white. So you can imagine he's covered in white dust. My face, neck, hands, from unaccustomed exposure to the air and sun were burnt to a berry brown. From head to foot, I was powdered almost as white with chalk and dust, as if I had come out of a lime kiln. In this plight, and with a strong consciousness of it, I waited to introduce myself and make my first impression on my formidable aunt. Formidable kind of means, well, really what formidable means is like you're afraid to challenge it. It would be difficult to challenge or difficult to fight. But here it kind of means like he's afraid of her. She's somebody to be afraid of. And here he is standing covered in dirt. His clothes are all torn. And this will be the first time he meets his aunt, who everybody's afraid of. The unbroken stillness of the parlor window lead, uh, leading me to infer after a while that she was not there. I lifted up my eyes to the window above it, so on the, the next floor, where I saw a florid, pleasant-looking gentleman with, with a gray head who shut up one eye in a grotesque manner, nodding his head at me several times, shook it at me often, laughed, and went away. So so one of his eyes was closed, and he was nodding at Davy, looking at him in a very weird kind of way, and then he left the window. I had been discomposed enough before, but I was so much the more discomposed by this unexpected behavior that I was on the point of slinking off. So slinking off means like going like this, running away. So that, that was so weird to see that old man in the window looking at Davy with one eye closed and nodding at him and then going away. There were so many other things, crazy things that happened on that journey, but that was so weird. He wanted to slink away, like run away. I had best, uh, I wanted... I was on the point of slinking off to think how I had best proceed when there came out of the house a lady with a handkerchief tied over her cap and a pair of garden gloves on her hands, wearing a gardening pocket like a, t like a tall man's apron and carrying a great knife. I knew her immediately to be Miss Betsy, for she came stalking out of the house exactly as my poor mother had so often described her, stalking up to the garden at Blunderstone Rookery. So he rec he's never seen his aunt, but he recognized her immediately from all of the stories that he had heard of her and the way that she acts and the way that she walks. Go away, said Miss Betsy, shaking her head and making a distant chop in the air with a knife. Go along, no boys here. I watched her with my heart at my lips as she marched to a corner of her garden and stooped down to dig some little root out there. Then without a scrap of courage, but with a great deal of desperation, so he wasn't feeling brave, but he was so desperate. I went softly in and stood beside her, touching her with my finger. If you please, ma'am, I began. She started. Remember, starting is about surprise. It doesn't mean begin here. It means she was shocked. She was surprised. She started and looked up. If you please, aunt. Eh? Exclaimed Miss Betsy in a tone of amazement that I've never heard approached. 
If you please, aunt, I'm your nephew. Oh, Lord, said my aunt, and sat flat down in the garden path. I'm David Copperfield of Blunderstone in Suffolk, where you came that night when I was born and saw my dear mamma. I've been very unhappy since she died. I've been slighted. I've been taught nothing and thrown upon myself and put to work not fit for me. It made me run away to you. I was robbed at first setting out. I have walked all the way and have never slept in a bed since I began the journey. Here my self-support gave way all at once, and with a movement of my hands extended to show my ragged state, my horrible state, the way I looked, called to witness I had suffered something. I broke out into a passion of crying, which I suppose had been pent up with me all the week. My aunt, with every sort of expression but wonder, discharged from her countenance. So that means that she she had nothing she wasn't angry anymore, she was just surprised. Sat on the gravel, staring at me until I began to cry. When she got up in a great hurry, collared me, and took me into the parlor. Her first proceeding there was to unlock a tall press, bring out several bottles, and pour the contents into, of each into my mouth. I think they must have been taken out at random, for I'm sure I tasted aniseed water, anchovy sauce, and salad dressing. She doesn't know what to do with him, so she brings him into the house, and she opens a cabinet, and she just starts giving him things to because she doesn't know what to do. Uh, so she thinks this is going to be medicine or help him somehow, but she's just really panicking. When she had administered these restoratives, as I was still quite hysterical and unable to control my sobs, so Davy's still crying and crying, she put me on the sofa with a shawl under my head, oh, for like a pillow, and the handkerchief from around her head, under my feet, lest I should sully the cover. So she took her handkerchief off. She had her handkerchief over her hat and tied. But she took it off and then she put it on his feet because he was so dirty, she didn't want to make the sofa dirty. And then, sitting herself down behind the green fan or screen I've already mentioned, so that I could not see her face, ejaculated at intervals, mercy on us, letting those exclamations off like minute guns. So she still doesn't know what to do, and all she can say is, mercy on us, and she keeps saying that over and over again. After a time, she rang the bell, and Janet... Oh, Janet, said my aunt, when her servant came in, go upstairs, give my compliments to Mr. Dick, and say I wish to speak to him. Janet looked a little surprised. That's Remember, that's the servant girl who, who let Davy follow her to the home. And now she's looking at him like, who? <laughs> she let him inside? What is she doing with this dirty boy? Janet looked a little surprised to see me lying stiffly on the sofa. I was afraid to move, lest it should be displeasing to my aunt, but went on her errand. My aunt, with her hands behind her, walked up and down the room until the gentleman, until the gentleman who had squinted, this is squinting, at me from the upper window, came in laughing. Mr. Dick, my, said my aunt, don't be a fool, because nobody can be more discreet than you can when you choose. We all know that. So don't be a fool, whatever you are. Uh, discreet means keeping secrets, not telling people, not being noticed by other people. So she's saying nobody can be more discreet than you can. Nobody can be less noticeable than you can when you choose. 
The gentleman was serious immediately because before he was acting a little bit weird, but Betsy told him, stop it, act normal. I think that's really what it's saying here. And then he looks serious. I thought as soon as uh, if he would entreat me to say nothing about the window. Oh, so you know, he was acting weird, doing some weird behavior at the window. And now he was looking at Davy saying, don't tell your aunt that I was acting weird at the window. Mr. Dick, said my aunt, you have heard me mention David Copperfield. Now don't pretend that you have no memory because you know, and I know better. David Copperfield, said Mr. Dick, who did not appear to me to remember much about it. David Copperfield. Oh, yes, to be sure. David, certainly. Well, said my aunt, this is his boy, his son. He would be as like his father as it is possible to be if he was not so like his mother, too. So Betsy is sure that this is her nephew because it looks so much like his father, but he also looks very much like his mother. His son, said Mr. Dick, David's son, indeed. Yes, pursued my aunt, and he has done a pretty piece of business. He has run away. Ah, his sister, Betsy Trotwood, never would have run away. My aunt shook her head firmly, confident in her character and behavior of the girl who was never born. When Davy was born, his aunt, who, who came that night to see the birth of the baby, was very angry that it was a boy instead of a girl. And so she left immediately <laughs> because she wanted a girl. She wanted a niece. And now in her head, she has this imaginary niece who she named Betsy Trotwood after herself. And she's saying, Betsy Trotwood would never run away. <laughs> oh, you think she wouldn't have run away, said Mr. Dick. Bless and save the man, exclaimed my aunt sharply. How he talks. Don't I know she wouldn't? She would have lived with her godmother, and we would have been devoted to one another. So Betsy is saying, if it had been a girl, I would have paid special attention to her and taken care of her, and she would never be in this situation because she would always live with me, and I would take very good care of her. Where in the name of wonder should his sister Betsy Trotwood have run from, or to? Nowhere, said Mr. Dick. Well then, returned my aunt, softened by the reply, how can you pretend to be wool-gathering, Dick? when you're as sharp as a surgeon's lancet. Now here you see young David Copperfield, and the question I put to you is, what shall I do with him? What shall you do with him? Said Mr. Dick feebly. Feebly means weak. What shall you do with him? Scratching his head. Oh, do with him? Yes, said my aunt with a grave look. Her forefinger held up. Come, I want some very sound advice. Why, if I was you, said Mr. Dick, considering and looking vacantly at me, when you, vacant means empty. And so when you look at somebody vacantly, that, that means it doesn't look like you have any idea. That's a vacant look, like there's nothing happening in your head. I should, the contemplation of me, seem to inspire him with a sudden idea. So he's looking at Davy, and then he goes, ah, I've got it. And he added briskly, I should wash him. <laughs> Janet, said my aunt, turning around with a quiet triumph, which I did not then understand. Mr. Dick sets us all right. Heat the bath. So, so uh, Betsy loves his common sense. That was a good idea. Let's give him a bath. Let's wash him. Although I was deeply interested in this dialogue, I could not help observing my aunt, Mr. Dick and Janet, 
while it while it was in progress and completing a survey, I had already been engaged in making of the room. Davy was very interested in all of these new people and the the dynamics of of his aunt and Mr. Dick and the maid. But even though he was very interested in that, he started looking around and 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 uh, observing the room, looking at the room itself for the first time. My aunt was a tall, hard-featured lady, but by no means ill-looking. So his aunt was attractive. You could tell she was a very serious person, but she wasn't ugly. She was an attractive woman. There was an inflexibility in her face, in her voice, in her gait and carriage. Gait and carriage, that's how you, how you move, how you walk. So she walked in a very, she was very confident. She walked in a very confident way. Her face was very confident. Her voice was very confident. Amply, to, uh, amply sufficient to account for the effect she had made upon a gentle creature like my mother. So Davy's saying, I could see why my mother was afraid of her. But her features were rather handsome and uh, than otherwise, though unbending and austere. So she looked very serious and uh, very stubborn, but she was an attractive woman. She was a pretty woman. I particularly noticed that she had a very quick, bright eye. Her hair, which was gray, was arranged in two plain divisions under what I believe to be called a mob cap. I mean a cap much more common uh, then than now. So let's look at what a mob cap is. Not that, not that you'll ever use this expression, but just so you can get a picture of, of what a mob cap is. It's a kind of head covering that a woman in the early 19th century would wear. That's a mob cap. Oh, uh, where did we stop? With side pieces fastening under her chin. Her dress was of a lavender color, so that's like a bright purple. Or a light purple color. And perfectly neat, but scantily made. That means that uh, it, was, it was a very nice dress, but it was very simple. As if she desired to be as little uh, encumbered as possible. Encumber is like when you, you're you not free to move. So if you're encumbered, that means it's difficult to move. So it was a very simple dress so that she could move very freely. So it was a very practical dress. I remember that I thought it in form more like a riding habit than the superfluous skirt cut off than anything else. She wore at her side a gentleman's gold watch. If I might judge from the size, uh, from its size and make, with an appropriate chain and seals, she had some linen at her throat, not unlike a shirt collar, and things at her wrists, like little shirt wristbands. So things at her wrists. Mr. Dick, as I've already said, was gray-headed and florid. I have to look up that word florid. I'm not sure what that means. Florid. Sounds nice, but I don't know what it is. Oh, it just means having a, a red complexion. So his his face had, had a lot of red on it. Kind of like mine. I guess I have a florid face. My my, my face is pretty red. <laughs> Let's see. I should have said all about him in saying so had not his head been curiously bowed. So that means he carries his head like this. This is how he stands. Mr. Dick is a little bit strange. Not by age. It reminded me of one of Mr. Creakle's boy's heads after a beating. 
So the the owner of the school where Davy was, Salem House, Mr. Creakle used to beat them all the time. And and when he sees Mr. Dick like this, it reminds him of the boys after Mr. Creakle would beat them. The same kind of body language. And his gray eyes, prominent and large, very big gray eyes, with a strange kind of watery brightness in them that made me in combination with his vacant manner. Remember, vacant means empty. So when you look at his face, you don't really understand what he's thinking. It's just blank. His submission to my aunt and his childish delight when she praised him. So if 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 his aunt, if, if Betsy Trotwood said something nice to Mr. Dick, he would be very happy. Suspect him of being a little mad. Though if he were mad, how he came to... How, how he came to be there puzzled me extremely. Davy is getting the idea that Mr. Dick is not normal. He's a little bit strange. And the way that they're using mad here means like crazy. Like Mr. Dick is a little bit crazy, a little bit weird. Uh, but if he was crazy, why was he living with Davy's aunt? That was the question Davy is asking. He was dressed like any other ordinary gentleman in loose gray morning coat and waistcoat and white trousers and had his watch in his fob and his money in his pockets, which he rattled as, as, as if he were very proud of it. So he had some coins or some money in his pocket and he would move it around in his pocket. You could hear the coins. You could hear the money. He rattled the coins in his pocket. Janet was a pretty blooming girl of about 19 or 20 and a perfect picture of neatness. Though I made no further observation of her at the moment, I may mention here that I did not discover until afterwards, namely, that she was one of a series of protégés whom my aunt had taken into her service expressly to educate in a renouncement of mankind and who had generally completed their abjuration by marrying uh, the baker. Da so da I, I, it seems like Davy's aunt really hates men. And this word protege, it comes from the same word as protect. And a protege is when somebody important or somebody with a lot of knowledge takes a younger person with them and sort of teaches them. It's kind of like a mentor. Uh, but also, I guess it's like a mentor, but maybe in, in this case, uh, she works for her. She gives her money also. So let's reread that for a minute. So I may mention here, I did not discover. So later Davy discovers that Janet, the servant girl, the maid, was a protege of his aunt. That means the aunt took her more than a maid. She was somebody who um, the aunt was trying to teach. I think what she was teaching was stay away from men. Men are evil. <laughs> Because it says uh, the ant took her expressly to educate in a renouncement of mankind, like hating everybody, and who had generally completed their abjuration by marrying the baker. I have to look up this word abjuration. I don't know what that means. I see the word jurish, jur, jury in there, like judgment. But let's let's see. So it must have something to do with judgment. Abjuration. Uh, the process. The process of abjuring. But what does that mean? Uh, wade into the sea, cry out for passage. Uh, to repudiate, to renounce. Okay. So let's look at that again with this idea that it, abjuration is like renouncing. Uh, so, so it seems like the aunt would take in these young ladies and she would try to educate them that they should be more practical and careful about people. And But what always would happen was eventually they would uh, renounce the aunt and go marry someone. 
in this case, marrying the baker. I'm pretty sure that's what it means. So the room was as neat as Janet or my aunt. As I laid down my pen, a moment since, to think of it, the air from the sea came blowing in again, mixed with the perfume of the flowers, and I saw the old-fashioned furniture brightly rubbed and polished. My aunt's inviolable chair, that means you can't sit in it, nobody can sit in it but her, and table by the round green fan in the bow window, and the drugget-covered carpet, the cat, the kettle holder, the two canaries, the old china, the punch bowl full of dried rose leaves, the tall press guarding all sorts of bottles and pots and wonderfully out of keeping with the rest, my dusty self upon the sofa, taking note of everything. Janet had gone away to get the bath ready when my aunt, to my great alarm, be became in one moment rigid with indignation. That means like angry, like, oh, what? I can't believe this. And had hardly the voice to cry out, Janet, donkeys. Uh, in case you don't know what a donkey is, I think we better, <laughs> this becomes important. This becomes an important part of the story. So let's take a look and see what a donkey is. This is a donkey. And Betsy Trotwood hates donkeys for some reason. Let's start over. Janet, donkeys! Upon which Janet came running up the stairs as if the house were in flames, darted out on a little piece of green in front, and warned off two saddled donkeys, lady ridden, that have presumed to set hoof upon it, while my aunt, rushing out of the house, seized the bridle of the third animal, laden with a bestriding child, turned him, led him forth from the sacred precincts, and boxed the ears of the unlucky urchin and attendants who had dared profane the hallowed ground. Okay, uh, that's uh, written in a funny way, but what it means is Davy's aunt saw some, some people coming near her property, coming onto her property, riding donkeys, and she hates donkeys. So there's a boy, a young boy, and two women, and all three of them are on donkeys. And it seems like the boy is like taking the women somewhere with the donkeys. So Miss Betsy runs out to the boy as she, she does this to him for bringing the donkeys onto her property because she hates donkeys. To this hour, I don't know whether my aunt had any lawful right of way over that patch of green but she had settled it in her own mind that she had, and it was all the same to her. The one great outrage in her life, demanding to constantly be avenged, was the passage of a donkey over that immaculate spot. So the one thing that would really make her angry, the one thing where if she saw it, she would have to do something, would be if a donkey passed by her house. She would get really angry and she would go out and attack. In whatever occupation she was engaged, however, however interesting to her the conversation in which she was taking part, a donkey turned the current of her ideas in a moment, and she was upon him straight. Jugs of water. So it, it doesn't matter what she was doing. If, if, if a donkey came near her house, she would, she would come out and attack. Jugs of water. Watering pots were kept in secret places ready to be discharged of the offending, on the offending boys. She actually kept containers of water in different places outside and inside the house so, so that she could be ready if, if any boy came riding past her house with a donkey and she would, she would use that water to, to attack them. 
sticks were laid in ambush behind the door. So she had sticks ready to to beat people with if they came with a donkey. Sallies were made at all hours. That means going out to running out to attack. So, so she would go out at any time, night or day, to attack. And incessant war prevailed. Perhaps this was an agreeable excitement to the donkey boys. And Davy's saying perhaps the, the donkey boys loved this. <laughs> they enjoyed watching her get angry. Or perhaps uh, the more sagacious of the donkeys, understanding how the case stood, delighted with constitutional obstinacy in coming that way, I only know that there were three alarms before the bath was ready. And that on the occasion of the last and most desperate of all, I saw my aunt engage in single-handed with a shady with a sandy headed lad of fifteen and bump his sandy head against her own gate. So well first of all, let's look at the word sagacious. I've seen that word before, but I don't remember what it means. Sagacious. Having or showing a keen mental discernment and good judgment. Shrewd. Okay, let's go back and see how they used sagacious. Perhaps this was an agreeable excitement to the donkey boys, or perhaps the more sagacious of the donkeys. So perhaps it was uh, agreeable to the donkeys with better judgment. Okay, whatever. Understanding how the case stood, delighted with uh, constitutional obstinacy and coming that way. I only know that there were three alarms before the bath was ready. So re remember they, they decided they're going to clean Davy, give him a bath. And so Janet was getting the bath ready. And during that time while the bath was getting ready, Three times donkeys came near the house. And uh, Davy remembers the last time uh, his aunt actually smashed the head of the boy onto the gate. <laughs> it was pretty violent. Before he seemed to comprehend what was the matter. These interruptions were of the more ridiculous to me because she was giving me broth out of a tablespoon at the time having firmly persuaded herself that I was actually starving and must receive nourishment at first in very small quantities. And while my mouth was yet open to receive the spoon, she would put it back into the basin and cry, Janet, donkeys, and go out to the assault. The bath was a great comfort, for I began to be sensible of acute pains in my limbs from lying out in the fields and was now so tired and so low that I could hardly keep myself awake for five minutes. When Davy was finally in the bath, he started to, to become aware of how much his body hurt from that long, week-long walk from London to Dover. When I had bathed, they, I mean my aunt and Janet, enrobed me, in a shirt and a pair of trousers belonging to Mr. Dick, and tied me up in two or three great shawls. Well, obviously they don't have children's clothes, so when he was finished with his bath, they couldn't, they couldn't put those old dirty clothes back on him. So they took some of Mr. Dick's clothes, which would be enormous for him, and he had to wear that. But then they also put several blankets on him, so he was a, a bundle. What sort of bundle I looked like, I don't know. Let's look at what a bundle is. A bundle is like a package, but it's like a package wrapped in cloth. Actually, when I look for the word bundle, they don't really show that. They show wood and they show books. But uh, when I think of bundle, I think of a lot of... Uh, well, actually, a lot of clothes. Like, it's kind of funny that they show that this is not a bundle. If it were in a pile, it would be like a bundle or tied together. But uh, I remember when I was young, 
and it was cold outside, my mother would say, bundle up. That means put on a lot of clothes. But, you know, when you when you look like that, uh, it, you just look like a pile of clothing. Wait, what if we do bundle up? Maybe that will show. See, that means put on... Actually, I remember this from a movie. This boy is bundled up. So you almost look like a pile of clothes more than you look like a uh, person. <laughs> and Davy is saying, you know, because they first they put on Mr. Dick's clothes, which are way too big for him. But then uh, they put on several blankets. So he says, what a bundle I looked like. I don't know. But I felt very hot. I felt a very hot one. Feeling also very faint and drowsy. Drowsy means tired. I soon lay down on the sofa again and fell asleep. It might have been a dream originating in the fancy which had occupied my mind so long, but I awoke with the impression that my aunt had come in and bent over me and had put my hair away from my face and laid my head more comfortably and then had stood looking at me and the words pretty fellow or poor fellow seemed to be in my ears too. Davy fell asleep on the sofa and he wasn't sure if it was a dream or if it really happened, but he remembers his aunt moving the hair away from his face and saying pretty fellow or poor fellow, but he doesn't know if that was real. But certainly there was nothing else when I awoke to lead me to believe that they had been uttered by my aunt, who sat at the bow window, gazing at the sea from behind the green fan, which is mounted on a kind of swivel. Swivel means you can turn it. And turned away. When Davy finally woke up, he saw his aunt sitting in her chair by the window. And so that was no evidence that she had actually gone over and touched him. We dined soon after I awoke off a roast fowl, a fowl is a bird, and a pudding. I sitting at the table, not unlike a trust bird myself. Let's look at a trust bird. That's like a tied up bird. But let's take a look at a picture. So when you're when you're cooking a bird, you usually will tie it up in a certain way before you put it in the oven. And this is trussing. So, and Davy's saying, uh, I was kind of like a trussed bird because he had all of these, <laughs> he was wrapped up in all of these clothes and blankets. He felt like a trussed bird. And moving my arms with considerable difficulty, because remember, he's got all these clothes on him. It's hard to move around. I made no complaint of being inconvenienced. All this time, I was deeply anxious to know what she was going to do with me. But she took her dinner in profound silence, except when she occasionally fixed her eyes on me sitting opposite and said, Mercy upon us! Which did not by any means really <laughs> relieve my anxiety. Davy, Davy still doesn't know what his aunt plans to do with him. And he wants to ask, but he's afraid. And she's not talking, she's just eating. Except sometimes she looks at Davy and she says, Mercy upon us, which makes him feel horrible. Because what does that mean? The cloth being drawn and some sherry put on the table, of which I had a glass, my aunt sent up for Mr. Dick again, who joined us and looked as wise as he could when she requested him to attend to my story, which she elicited me uh, from me gradually by a course of questions. During my recital, she kept her eyes on Mr. Dick, who I thought would have gone to sleep but for that and who whensoever he lapsed into a smile, was checked by my, by a frown from my aunt. Oh gosh. Okay, so his aunt wants to know the whole story, what happened. 
And the way that she gets the story is she asks Davy a lot of questions. And um, Mr. Dick is paying attention, but he's kind of falling asleep. And he's a little bit crazy, so he gets this stupid smile on his face. And every time he does that, the aunt says, she frowns, which is the opposite of smiling. And this keeps Mr. Dick at attention, paying attention. Whatever possessed that poor unfortunate baby that she must go and be married again, said my aunt, when I had finished, I can't conceive. Now the aunt is saying, why did she remarry? Why did your mother remarry? Because she married this horrible man who's been abusing Davy. And she says, I don't know why she remarried again. How stupid. Perhaps she fell in love with her second husband, Mr. Dick suggested. Fell in love, repeated my aunt. What do you mean? What business had she to do it? Perhaps, Mr. Dick simpered, after thinking a little, she did it for pleasure. Pleasure indeed, replied my aunt. A mighty pleasure for the poor baby to fix her simple faith upon any dog of a fellow, certain to ill use her in some way or other. What did she propose to herself? I should like to know. She had one husband. She had seen David Copperfield out of the world, who was always running after wax dolls from his cradle. She had got a baby. Oh, there were a pair of babies when she gave birth to this child sitting here that Friday night. And what, what more did she want? All right, so the aunt is saying, why was she remarry? That's That's so crazy. She's already been married once and then her husband died. Why would she put herself through that again when she knows that somebody could use her in a very bad way? And she was saying uh, both, both her nephew and Davy's mother were just like babies when they had Davy. Mr. Dick secretly shook his head at me as if he thought he was getting no, he was, uh, there was no getting over this. So Mr. Dick was trying to explain, well, maybe she was in love. Maybe she was lonely. And the aunt just can't understand that. So Mr. Dick is like <laughs> looking at Davy saying, I can't. She, she doesn't listen. Mr. Dick seemed quite frightened. That little man of a doctor with his head on one side, said my aunt, Jellips, or whatever his name was. What was he about? All he could do was to say to me like a robin red breast, as he is, it's a boy. A boy? Yeah. The imbecility of the whole set of them. <laughs> She's still angry about that night that Davy was born and he wasn't a girl. The hardiness of the ejaculation startled Mr. Dick exceedingly, and me too, if I'm to tell the truth. She's really upset about it. <laughs> and then, as if this was not enough, and she had not stood sufficiently in the light of this child's sister, Betsy Trotwood, <laughs> said my aunt, she marries a second time. Goes and mar marries a murderer, or a man with a name like it, and stands in this child's light. Uh, her second husband's name was Murdston, which sounds like murderer. And the natural consequence is, as anybody but a baby might have foreseen, that he prowls and wanders. He as like Cain before he was grown up, as he can be. Now the aunt is saying, of course, this is how it ended. This is what happened. Anybody could see that except for Davy's mother. Mr. Dick looked hard at me, as if to identify me in this character. And then there's that woman th with the pagan name, said my aunt. That peckety. She goes and gets married next, because she's not seen enough of the evil attending such things. She goes and she gets married next. As the child relates, I only hope, said my aunt, shaking her head, that her husband is one of those poker husbands <laughs> who abound in the newspapers and will beat her well with one. 
So, you know, the mother, uh, the, the aunt is saying that your mother gets married again. Didn't she learn her lesson after being married once that it's stupid to get married? And then that Peggy. Now, remember, Davy really loves Peggy. That's the only person who's uh, that's like his only friend in the world right now is Peggy. And she sent him money and she takes care of him and she loves him very much. And <laughs> the, the aunt is saying, and then Peggy. Peggy gets married. And she says, I only hope that she married one of those poker husbands. Let me show you what a poker is. This is horrible. <laughs> a poker is for a fire. And it's a very heavy piece of equipment. So this is for poking, poking the fire. And, and the aunt says, I hope that Peggy married one of those poker husbands meaning that that she reads about in the newspaper so uh, and that and that he beats her with a poker every night <laughs> what a horrible thing to say let's read that again now that you know what a poker is and then there's that woman with the pagan name said my aunt that Peggy. She goes and gets married next because she's not seen enough of evil of attending such things. So uh, the aunt is saying, then Peggy gets married? Didn't she see what happened to, to Davy's mother? Why would she get married? I only hope, said my aunt, shaking her head, that her husband is one of those poker husbands who abound in the newspapers and will beat her well with one. I could not bear to hear my old nurse so decried. So Davy got upset. He got angry when she said this and made the subject of such a wish. I told my aunt that indeed she was mistaken, that Peggy was the best and truest and most faithful, most devoted and most self-denying friend and servant in the world who had ever loved me dearly, who had ever loved my mother dearly, and who had held my mother's dying head upon her arm, and whose face my mother had implanted with her last grateful kiss. And my remembrance of them both, choking me, I broke down, and I was trying to say that her home was my home, and that all she had to do, and that all she had was mine, and that I would have gone to her for shelter, but for her humble station which made me fear that I might bring some trouble upon her. I broke down, I say, and I was trying to say so, and I laid my hands in my face, uh, I laid my face in my hands upon the table. All right. So Davy got really angry when she said that. And he said that she was the best person in the world, and he could not sit there and listen to her say such horrible things about her. And he he wanted to go he said this he wanted to go to Peggy instead of his aunt but that would have caused problems because they're in different stations in life uh, she's a servant and him going to a servant to stay this could cause huge problems big problems for Peggy so he couldn't do that and that's why he went to the aunt and not Peggy and then he says I broke down and what that means is, I started crying. I started crying a lot. That's what I broke down means. Well, well, said my aunt. The child is right to stand by those who have stood by him. So the aunt says, yeah, okay, you're right. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. You're right. I'm wrong. And then she says, Janet, donkeys! I thoroughly believe, but for those unfortunate donkeys, we should have come to a good understanding. For my aunt had laid her hand on my shoulder, and the impulse was upon me, thus emboldened, to embrace her and beseech her protection, to beg for her protection. But the interruption and the disorder she was thrown into by the struggle outside put an end to all softer ideas for the present and kept my aunt indignantly declaiming to Mr. Dick about her determination to appeal for redress to the laws of her country. 
and to bring actions for trespass against the whole donkey proprietorship of Dover until tea time. So there was this moment and Davy got upset and he said, don't talk about Peggotty like that. She's a good person. And the aunt agreed. And they had like this moment where she had touched his shoulder and he was about to hug her and say, please, please protect me. Please help me. And it probably would have worked except the donkeys came and that sent her running out of the house to attack. <laughs> After tea, we sat at the window on the lookout. So that means looking for donkeys. As I imagined from my aunt's sharp expression on her face for more invaders. <laughs> Until dusk, that's when the sun comes down, dusk. When Janet set candles and the backgammon board on the table and pulled down the blinds. Now, Mr. Dick, said my aunt with her grave look, grave means serious. Now, Mr. Dick, with her grave look and her and her forefinger up as before. I'm going to ask you another question. Look at this child, David's son. David's son, said Mr. Dick with an attentive, puzzled, that means confused, a puzzled face, David's son. Exactly so, returned my aunt. What would you do with him now? Do with David's son, said Mr. Dick. I, replied my aunt, with David's son. And in case you don't know, I is an alternative way to say yes. Kind of old fashioned now, but you can still hear people saying that sometimes. I, yes, replied my aunt, with David's son. Oh, said Mr. Dick, yes, do with. I should put him to bed. Janet, cried my aunt with the same complacent triumph that had remarked that I had remarked before, Mr. Dick sets us all right. If the bed is ready, we'll take him up to it. <clears throat> Janet reporting to be quite ready, I was taken up to it. Uh, kindly, but in some sort of like a prisoner, my aunt going in the front and Janet bringing me up the rear. The only circumstance which gave me any new hope was my aunt's stopping on the stairs to inquire about a smell of fire that was prevalent there, and Janet's replying that she had been making tinder down in the kitchen of my old shirt. So they decide to take Davy to bed, and Davy feels a little bit like a prisoner because he's got the aunt in the front leading the way to the bedroom and the servant in the back following him like he's like captured and he still doesn't know what his aunt plans to do with him but as they're walking up the stairs the aunt says i smell something burning there's a fire and and janet says oh yes um uh, I, I i burned davy's clothes his old clothes his old dirty clothes and so that that gave davy a little bit of hope that they were going to keep him. He still doesn't know, but that was a good sign that they were burning his old clothes. But there were no other clothes in my room than the odd heap of things I wore. And when I was left there with a little taper, which my aunt forewarned me would, would burn exactly five minutes. So they left him in the room and there was a little bit of the candle left. Uh, and the aunt said, that, that would probably last about five minutes before the, the candle would burn out. I heard them lock the door on the outside. Turning these things over in my mind, thinking about these things, I deemed it possible that my aunt, who could know nothing of me, might suspect I had the habit of running away and took precautions on that account uh, to have me in safekeeping. So Davy thought, why did they lock my bedroom door? Why did they lock me in here? And he was thinking, maybe she thinks I'm a bad boy and I always run away. And maybe I would run away in the middle of the night. So she locked the door uh, to prevent me from that. 
The room was a pleasant one at the top of the house overlooking the sea, on which the moon was shining brilliantly. After I had said my prayers and the candle had burned out, I remember how I still looked, how I still sat looking at the moonlight on the water, as if I could hope to read my fortune in it, as in the bright book, as in a bright book, or to see my mother with her child coming from heaven along the shining path to look upon me as she had looked when I last saw her sweet face. I remember how the solemn feeling with which at length I turned my eyes away yielded to the sensation of gratitude and rest, which the sight of the white curtained bed and how much more of li uh, the lying softly down upon it, nestling in the snow white sheets. Inspired, I remember how I thought of all the solitary places under the night sky where I had slept and how I prayed that I never might be houseless anymore and how never might forget the houseless. I remember how I seemed to float then down the melancholy glory of that track upon the sea away, away into the world of dreams. So Davy is feeling very happy and grateful that he's in this nice comfortable bed and he's remembering those nights that he spent walking to Dover under the sky and how miserable it was and how he hoped that he would never be in a situation where he didn't have a home again. All right, and that is the end of chapter 13 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. And next time we will read chapter 14, which is my aunt makes up her mind about me. And when you make up your mind, that means you're making a decision. So this means my aunt makes a decision about me. So is she going to keep him or not keep him? That's what we'll find out in chapter 14. Well, thank you everyone who stayed and watched for the entire reading of chapter 13 and it will be fun to find out what happens in chapter 14. I will see you then. Goodbye.